Good afternoon. Welcome and happy Constitution and, and Citizenship Day to you all. Uh, the new academic calendar here at Dartmouth now allows us to actually celebrate Constitution Day on Constitution Day. Uh, in years past, we've been off campus or wandering about the countryside before we were getting back to Hanover, so now today we actually can celebrate it on its correct day. My name is Ron Scheich. I'm the Associate Director of the Rockefeller Center here at Dartmouth College. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's Constitution Day speaker, Senator Judd Gregg. Throughout his more than three decades of public service to the citizens of New Hampshire, beginning with his election to the Governor's Executive Council in 1978, through his service in the United States House of Representatives from 1981 to 1989, here serving the, Congre the second congressional district of New Hampshire, his two terms as governor from 1989 to 93, and finally 18 years of service in the United States Senate from 1993 to 19, uh, 2001 or 2011. Throughout this time, Judd Gregg was a steadfast champion for Dartmouth College and for higher education in the state of New Hampshire more generally. He has left his mark on this campus and on campuses across the state. It is safe to say that IP3, the Institute for Information and Infrastructure Protection, and ISTS, the Institute for Science, uh, Security, Technology, and Society, would not exist today on their current footprint or their research tra trajectory without the support of, of Senator Gregg. His work on these and other projects in the Senate on our behalf has served countless students, faculty, and administrators very well for the past three decades. And for that, we as a college will be always grateful to you. We can only hope that Senators Shaheen and Ayotte aspire to champion our cause in Washington to the extent that Senator Gregg has and had. While Senator Gregg is no stranger to the college as a public speaker, today's Constitution Day lecture marks Senator Gregg's first public presentation as the inaugural Dartmouth Distinguished Fellow. This newly created position at the college will allow Senator Gregg to interact with students, faculty, and the community for the next three years through lectures, meetings with faculty and students in classes, and individual advising sessions. He will serve as an important resource for the faculty and for students with broad interest in government and the public policy making process. In fact, this very lecture today is directly linked to one of our fall courses in public policy, uh, Public Policy 20, Contemporary Issues in American Politics and Public Policy, taught by Charlie Whalen. Senator Gregg will meet with that class after the elections in November. Today's lecture by Senator Gregg is titled, The Role of the Senate and the Coming Fiscal Crisis. As the Constitution Day lecture, we will we'll be focusing at, on Article 1 of the Constitution as our jumping off point. Article 1 lays out the framework for the legislative branch of our federal government and outlines the enumerated and applied powers of Congress. Article 1, Section 8 includes among the laundry list of enumerated powers one key clause of special relevance to today's topic. The Congress shall have the power to borrow money on credit of the United States. Not the President, Congress. Therefore, while Presidents may be co-conspirators in creating and in fact accumulating our national debt, Ultimately, it is the Congress that controls the purse of our federal government. Perhaps more accurately, it is the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate who control our purse strings and who ultimately will have to solve our budget problems. Throughout his career in the House and the Senate, Senator Gregg has focused his attention on the federal budget process, eventually serving as chair and then ranking member of the Senate Budget Committee. He entered the House when the current budget process we know today was still in its infancy, when the budget committees were still trying to figure out their institutional roles, what they would be, and the Congressional Budget Office was still wrestling with how to establish itself vis-a-vis -vis the Office of Management and Budget in the White House in setting budget targets and baselines. Today, more than 30 years later, Senator Gregg remains significantly engaged in federal budgetary matters, among several other pursuits. Now that he has left office, the Senator is becoming more accustomed to wearing many hats. In addition to his position here at Dartmouth as the inaugural Distinguished Fellow, Senator Gregg also serves as, uh, on several corporate boards. He's an international advisor to uh, Goldman Sachs. He's a senior advisor to New Mountain Capital. He writes a weekly column in the Hill newspaper in Washington. He serves as a regular contributor to CNBC. You've seen him on Squawk Box, on Cudlow Report, and many other shows on that cable network channel. If that weren't enough to keep a retired senator busy, Senator Gregg now co-chairs with former Senator Alan Simpson, former White House Chief of Staff Erskine Bowles, and former 
governor of Pennsylvania, Ed Rendell, the Fix the Debt campaign, a national bipartisan effort to convince and promote significant congressional action to reduce the budget deficit and the national debt, uh, or more succinctly, to have them act like adults in Congress. We at the Rockefeller Center are thrilled to have Senator Gregg join us today to share his thoughts on an institution that he cares deeply about, the United States Senate, and on a problem that he has invested much of his political career trying to resolve, our national debt. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator Judd Gregg. Thank you, very generous. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Very much appreciated. And it's a great pleasure to be here. It's even a, a great more of an honor and a privilege to be named the first distinguished fellow here at Dartmouth. Uh, somebody suggested it should be extinguished because I'm <laughs> former, but as a very practical matter, it, it is an honor and a privilege. And Kathy and I have spent years, literally, when we were very young, we used to come up here a lot, uh, and we've continued that, and uh, we've always had a wonderful relationship with Dartmouth. Uh, three of our children went here, so. Uh, it's been great fun watching what Dartmouth gave them, which was a wonderful zest for life and education and, and an ability to succeed once they left Dartmouth in a way that uh, was extraordinary. So it's just a pleasure, a pleasure to be named to this post. It's nice to be here today to talk about, on Constitution Day, the role of the Senate and uh, specifically the role of the Senate as it has evolved and then as it is, what role it is going to play and what I considered to be the single biggest issue we face as a nation after the number one issue, which is, of course, a terrorist using a weapon of mass destruction against our nation is our number one concern as a nation. But after that, the biggest issue we have, in my opinion, is the issue of how we get our fiscal house in order because we are on a path which is unsustainable and we are on the verge of passing on to our children a nation uh, which does not have the financial capability of giving our children the type of prosperous lifestyle that we've had and will actually uh, lead to a diminution in standard of living in this country if we continue on our present course. It's interesting that today is uh, Constitution Day. Uh, my colleague in the Senate for years, in fact he was the longest serving member of the Senate so I wasn't there as long as he was, uh, Bob Byrd always used to carry around this copy of the Constitution which he had memorized. I, I have not memorized mine. Um, and it's a really fascinating document, as we all know. I hope many of you have read it, taken the time, although actually not too many Americans, I think, have read it. Uh, interestingly enough, today's the wrong day for Constitution Day, just to start out. Uh, Constitution Day should be June 9th, because that's when New Hampshire ratified the Constitution. And it took nine states to make the Constitution effective, according to the Constitutional Convention. New Hampshire was the ninth just barely beating out uh, either New York or Virginia, I'm not sure which, but in any event, it was the only reason the Constitution is, is, exists is because of New Hampshire. That's the way we view it here <laughs> in New Hampshire. Uh, I don't know if any of you have taken the time to read a book called Miracle of Philadelphia, but it's a fascinating book about what happened in the creation of the Constitution. It's a short book. It came out during the 200th anniversary of, of the Constitution. and. Um, one of the things that is fascinating to me, at least, is how, you know, we, we take it for granted now that there's a written constitution for our nation. This, is totally, this was totally new at the time, the concept of a written document that would guide a nation that involved the people preparing the document. The closest thing, of course, would have been the Magna Carta, but that wasn't really the type of document that our constitution was. Is that interference bothering you folks? Because I can just turn this off and talk. You can probably hear me, right? Is that interference affecting you? Okay. Um, it's hard to find. There's a lot of sources for the Constitution, of course, and the starting of, with the Greek republics and Plato and Aristotle. But really, the essence of the Constitution grew out of what's known as the Scottish Enlightenment, which was begun by John Locke, and it led to Lord Keynes and Francis uh, Hutchinson and uh, David Hume and Adam Smith in the early 1700s, and it was really their thought process that caused this extraordinary collection of people at Philadelphia to develop our concept of, of governance. And what I find interesting is these 
these groups that sort of gather and feed off of each other. You see it all through history where there's a small, you know, here in Edinburgh and Glasgow, Scotland, really the genesis of all the great thought that led to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution began, just with a small group of people. And the thing they stress, struggled with mostly was how do, you def, how do you balance liberty and government? Because most of the governments they saw were autocratic, of course, at the time. They were the kings. And liberty for them was the ability to pursue happiness and own property. Uh, and they understood that you couldn't have liberty unless you had a government to protect the liberty because the person with a gun would, might take away your property or the person with a gun might take away your happiness and you needed the government to manage that. But they hadn't quite conceived yet how you'd actually merge the two in a way that it would actually work because they, all, the governments they were used to were all autocratic governments. So uh, they came up with the theories and it took Madison, Randolph, Jefferson, although he wasn't at the convention, Franklin, uh, to basically take those theories and bring them into something, bring them into our Constitution, which uh, is a most amazing document. Uh, the Bill of Rights being obviously equally amazing, but it was not, of course, designed at Philadelphia. It came as a result of the states wanting to make sure that the rights of the states and the individuals were preserved during the rat with the ratification of the Constitution. So we want to talk about the Senate's role in the Constitution. And I think it's important to to just look at what it says about the Senate, not the enumerated powers which were mentioned, because those apply to both the Senate and the House. But it's a pretty simple statement. And it says, uh, Article three, uh, Section 3, Article 1, the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state. For six years, chosen for six years, each senator shall have one vote. This uh, language was at the essence of what allowed the Philadelphia Convention to reach an agreement. It was called the Great Compromise. The struggle in Philadelphia involved a lot of different issues, regional issues, agriculture versus the Northeast, uh, the New England mercantile states, free traders in the Northeast versus protectionists in the South. But the biggest struggle, of course, was the role of the different, what had been colonies, states, as they related to each other, because their sizes were significantly different, the amount of population was significantly different, and the smaller states were very concerned about the larger states basically taking everything over. And the whole convention probably would have broken down, except for, in fact, as I want to read your quote talking about that, uh, except for this great compromise. And the great compromise was essentially this, that the Federalists, the people who wanted a very strong central government, remember we'd had the Articles of Confederation, which was really a, an incredibly weak form of central government, almost a government by unanimity, which ne has never worked. It didn't work in Poland in the 1700s, in 1700s it didn't work here. Uh, that central desire to have a strong central government, not strong as we see it today, of course, the central, federal government is so strong. But back then, a government that was strong enough they would have the right to raise revenue, the right to defend the nation, the right to control commerce. These were big things, big gives on the part of those folks who were suspicious of central government. And most of those folks came from small states. And so they agreed to that federalist system, which was basically the design of Randolph and Madison, uh, in exchange for the protection of the small states by the creation of the Senate. And it's interesting, uh, which gave each state two votes. It's interesting, during the ratification process, that uh, the, the debate over ratification, and it went state by state, of course, very much involved the debate over what was the role of the Senate. And, and there was a real sort of view that the Senate was an appendage that you really didn't need. I mean, what do you need a Senate for? And in fact, uh, there was a guy named Singletary who was a farmer from Massachusetts who during the convention said, these senators, they're just going to become perpetual, perpetual people in government. And they're going to they're going to move to where the seat of the government is. They're not going to come back to their states. I can't believe he said that. I mean, <laughs> think about it. And, and, and then another another person, I think it uh, may have been Kayla, uh, uh, Jer Jerry from Massachusetts, said, "Well, they're going to be arrogant people. The Senate's going to be filled with a lot of arrogant people because they're independent and they've had these six-year terms. Everybody was upset about the six-year terms." But uh, James Wilson, who was basically from uh, from Pennsylvania and who was at the convention and who had originally opposed the concept of a strong federal government, but after participating in the convention came to the conclusion that there should be one. Uh, he said that, no, we have to have a Senate because we wouldn't have a constitutional, we wouldn't have a constitution to vote on if we didn't have the Senate. It was the essence of the ratification process. 
that the Senate be included for the smaller states to participate. In fact, just to read his quote, at the Philadelphia Convention, he said, the Philadelphia Convention, at the, at the convention in Pennsylvania to ratify the convention, the Philadelphia Convention would have broken up if it had not been agreed to to allow representation in the states through the Senate. This, is, this was what was at the essence of what got the, got the, the compromise to go forward. And then it took, um, took Madison to come along and, and really explain the purposes of the Senate in the Federalist Papers, which I'm sure some of you have read. But in Federalist uh, 63, he says, he basically outlines three things. I want to read them all to you because this, they're really important. He said, this is why we have a Senate. The, the paper was on why we have a Senate. In this spirit, it may be remarked, and this is Madison writing in, obviously, this late 1700s, so his language is of that period, that equal vote allowed to each state is at once a constitutional recognition of the portion of sovereignty remaining in the individual states and an instrument for preserving that residuary sovereignty. So far, the equality ought to be no less acceptable to the larger than the small states, since they are not less solicitous to guard by every possible expediency against an improper consolidation of the states into one simple republic. So that was his first point, that, that basically you needed a Senate to protect the states so that they didn't end up getting consolidated into one country in the way that you would have no, no federalist system. The second point he makes is, it is, the mis it is a misfortune incident to republic governments, though in a less degree than to other governments, that those who administer it may forget their obligation to their constituents and prove unfaithful to their important trust. In this point of view, a Senate as a second branch of the legislative assembly, distinct from the dividing powers with a first, must in all cases be a salutary check on the government. It doubles the security of the people. And then he went on to say, as his third purpose, as his third key purpose, that you have a Senate because you don't want a mutable government. You don't want a government that basically doesn't have stability. And by having a Senate, you have stability and respectability in the government. And in fact, I, uh, I'm not sure I can work this machine, but I'm going to take a run at it. There we go. All right, it worked. Wow, boy, becoming technology first. You know, that's get, leaving the Senate has given me all sorts of new skills. I, <laughs> I went from 75 staff people. I had staff for my budget committee, staff for my health committee, staff for my appropriations committee, my own staff. On December, th on January 4th, I got a Blackberry. <laughs> that was it. And now my wife, Kathy, she doesn't consider her, she she's, keeps me on track. But anyway, this is uh, the Federalist Second. For, he says, no government any, any more than an individual will long be respected without being truly respectable, nor be truly respectable without possessing a certain portion of order and stability. And he saw the Senate as the place where the government would be respectable and maintain order and stability. Mm, I can accept that as a former senator, that that's a pretty good approach to the way you should approach the Senate. So we got through the Great Compromise, and the Constitution was ratified, and the government started going forward, and it evolved. And that's, of course, one of the most amazing things about our Constitution is it is a very malleable document, although its core values are, are, are very clear and, and definable. It's, those values are constantly mutating as to how they're applied. And of course, the Senate became the dominant force in American political culture in the beginning of the country, especially in the period 1820 to 1830, uh, when you had the major debates which were occurring around the issue of whether the country could be separated and pulled apart. And you had Clay and Calhoun and Webster. And Calhoun wanted, from South Carolina, wanted the states to be able to nullify any federal law. And he felt that that was the right. That, that that was protect, protected in the Constitution and under the Bill of Rights. Under Clay and, and Webster felt that that would undermine the concept of a nation and would basically lead to our disunion. And of course, this was all a growing ferment which was built around the issue of slavery. And 
This came to a peak in a debate in the Senate between Daniel Webster and Senator Haynes from South Carolina. And the debate went on over three or four days. Webster spoke for two days, I believe. And he wrapped it up by saying, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. And those words became the dominant strain of commitment to one nation until Lincoln came. And that speech was memorized in schools across the country for years, well past the, past the Civil War. And I believe, and I don't think there's any question about this, although I've never seen a lot of discussion of it, that our nation would not exist today if it had not been for Webster's and Clay's management of and defeat of the nullification language. Uh, we were a weak country still then. We were a regional country still then. And had our country broken up and gone to civil war in 1830 as versus in 1860, I think it's very unlikely that the North would have been able to dominate the South and keep the country together. And so you can argue that, the, and I do argue, that, this, that it was the Senate and really the, the leadership of the Senate that kept the country together long enough so that a Lincoln could come along and basically preserve the Union when we finally decided to settle unequivocally the issue of slavery, which had to be settled at some point. And of course the Senate has evolved over the years, never really retained, gotten to that level of status, but still maintained the, the primacy of the position within the Congress. And there's been great senators who've had a huge impact on the course of American life, Lodge and Vander, Vandenberg being two, but there are many, many. And now we're at a point where the question is, I believe, and it's legitimately asked, is the Senate still maintain that sort of relevance? Or has it become a collection of egos? Has it become a marginalized body? And that's a legitimate question because there has been, over the last few years, a change in the, in the Senate, uh, which I'm concerned about and which I want to talk about and we'll lead into the discussion a little bit about fiscal policy. But basically, you know, it went from a body <coughs> where its purpose was to protect the states to a body where its purpose is to protect the minority. It remains within our check and balance structure, the only place where a person where the minority views must be heard historically because of the right of amendment and the right uh, of open debate on the floor uh, within the three branches. Uh, within the two branches that are legislative or, or, or administrative. The presidency obviously doesn't hear from the minority. The president is the one party. The House, because it's an autocratic body built off of a set of rules which basically give the Speaker of the House absolute power over the House, is also not a balanced, open system. The Senate, on the other hand, as Washington said, is the saucer into which the hot coffee is poured. It's the place where things are supposed to be debated, but more importantly, it's the place where the rights of the minority are protected. Robert Byrd, who I mentioned earlier, who not only was the longest serving senator, but the historian of the Senate, said, the Senate is the one place in the whole government where the minority is guaranteed a public airing of its views. As long as the Senate retains the power to amend and the power to unlimited debate, the liberties of the people will remain secure. And I agree 100% with that, but the question today is, is that, that character of the Senate going to be maintained? The Senate appears to be, if not broken, severely damaged on two, two levels. One is doing the ordinary business of the government. It hasn't passed a budget in four years. The House has. It hasn't passed appropriation bills. They used to come across the floor one at a time. I was the chairman of appropriating bill, appropriating committee, and when I was in the Senate from the mid-90s as chairman to the mid 2000s six period, we took up 13 and then 12 appropriation bills in order, they all came to the floor. Appropriations bills discuss how you're going to spend money on certain functions of the government, the Defense Department, the Education Department, the Health Department, and you voted on it. Doesn't do that anymore. And committees used to be the place where laws were written and structured. Committees are no longer where laws are written. Laws are written and structured in the cloakroom of the majority leader. In fact, Obamacare, which was arguably the most significant law passed in the last four years, uh, was written in the majority leader's office by staff 
of a couple of committees and by his staff, and then it was brought to the floor of the Senate on a Saturday afternoon before Christmas, and then it was voted on Christmas Eve, three days later, without any significant amendments. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, now in the Senate is a movement, and I think this is in part because so many of the Senate leadership came out of the House, a movement towards a House type of system where basically debate is not allowed unless it is very structured, amendments aren't allowed unless they are pre-cleared by the majority, and as a result, the openness of the body is being, in my opinion, put at risk. And uh, I'll just show you one statistic which sort of reflects this. This is called filling the tree. Now, under the rules of the Senate, <clears throat> all senators are equal, except for one thing. All senators are equal on the floor of the Senate, except for one thing. The majority leader has right of recognition. So that if I am a senator and I'm on the floor and I want to offer an amendment or I want to speak and I rise to ask for the chair's recognition and the majority leader rises at the same time, the chair must recognize the majority leader. The effect of that is that the majority leader controls the floor of flow of legislation and amendments to the floor if he wishes to. And filling the tree is when the majority leader takes a bill to the floor, brings it up, and then immediately files amendments on every point in that bill that it can be amended. So that nobody else can come to the floor and amend the bill. That's called filling the tree. It is a way of shutting down debate and taking control of the floor, almost identical to what the House does under the Speaker of the House, where they have a rules committee which tells the floor what can be offered as amendments. And it is extremely stiltifying event. It means basically that the floor is now under the total and absolute control of the majority leader and that as a result there's going to be no amendments or, and virtually no debate that's not acceptable to it. And you can see that this process has been used over the years, filling the tree, but then in the last two sessions of Congress, the last two Congresses, it's been dramatically increased. And the practical effect of it is to shut down the Senate as the place where the minority gets its views heard. Now, you, you hear a lot of debate about the filibuster and about the abuse of the filibuster. This is all tied to the filling of the tree because when the minority has the tree filled on it and can't offer amendments, it basically is written out of the legislative process. So what the minority, the only, minority's only, only way to, res, to address, redress that is to do something called filibustering the motion to proceed. The motion to proceed is a motion brought up by the majority leader to go to a bill. You have to do that before you can go to a bill, you have to, unless it's a unique bill, like the budget. But if the minority can't filibuster the motion to proceed, then the minority has no leverage to force the majority leader to allow amendments. But as long as the minority can filibuster the motion to proceed so that the motion to proceed can't go forward, then the bill can't go forward. And so why you hear about all these filibustering events is because the minority is trying to protect its rights when the bill gets to the floor to keep the tree from being filled and to be allowed to amend. And this is a huge issue, huge issue. And it, it unfortunately isn't understood. It's not understood by the press especially which sees that as, uh, sees the filibustering of the motion to proceed as dilatory and, and obstructionist, when in fact what it's doing is protecting the most important activity which the Senate has today, which is the right of the minority to participate in the process. If you take the Senate out of our constitutional system as a place where the minority can participate in the process, you are going to fundamentally harm our system over the long run. You might benefit briefly with some bills that pass that you like, but over the long run, you're going to harm the system. And, and so this is a huge issue that, that the Senate is wrestling with right now. Which brings us to the question of, can the Senate under this atmosphere, where it's not passing any budgets, it's only passing appropriations as omnibus bills, and it's shutting down the floor to debate and amendment, can the Senate be the place where really tough decisions are taken on and we've got some very tough decisions we have to take on. This chart, which some of you have seen if you've, seen, had any, if you've been to a talk before, and I know a couple of you have, this chart reflects the problem we're headed towards as a nation. The biggest problem we have after a weapon of mass destruction being used by terrorists. 
it shows that our spending as a nation is going up dramatically. That's the red line. The historical spending of the country is the dotted red line, which has always been about 20 percent of GDP. It's going up exponentially. The initial limp up was the, was the really severe recession caused by the fiscal financial collapse of 2008. Revenues are on the bottom line. They're the dotted blue line. Historically, revenues have been about 18.6 percent of GDP, 18.2 percent. And you can see that they dropped precipitously. And this caused, this point in here caused these really historically bad deficits of 1.3, 1.4, 1.2 trillion dollars, which we've had for the last three years. Now, as the recession ended, theoretically at least, or no, actually in practice, as recession ends, spending usually comes down because the safety net issues which kicked in to drive spending up start to back out. And revenues start to come back because the economy picks up. And the lines are supposed to start to meet in the post-recessionary climate. And you can see the revenues are coming back up and projected to be well over their historic levels, heading towards 20 percent of GDP. Unfortunately, spending is going up exponentially. And this gap here, this gap out here, is where our problem as a nation is. It's a fact under all projections that our deficits are going to run at about a trillion dollars a year for as far as the eye can see, maybe even more. And to try to put that in context, we never had a deficit over $450 billion until 2009. And that the spending of the federal government is going to continue straight up until it hits about 30 percent of GDP. What's driving this are a couple of things, but the primary thing that's driving it is the retirement of the post-war baby boom generation of which I'm a member. This generation is the largest generation in the nation's history. We're going from 35 million retired people to 70 million retired people, and they will arguably be, or technically be, fully retired by 2017. All of our entitlement systems, and especially the important ones, the big ones, Social Security and Medicare, were built on the philosophy of a pyramid, that there would always be many more working people paying in than retired people taking out. And in fact, in the 50s, for example, in Social Security, there were almost 16 people paying in for every one person taking out. Because of the retirement of the baby boom generation, we've gone from a pyramid to a rectangle. Today, in Social Security, 2.2 people pay in for every one person taking out. So these entitlements simply aren't sustainable. Now, the, now there have been two or three runs at trying to get this under control. And because these issues are so big and so pervasive in the way they affect all Americans, I happen to believe you can't get them under control unless you have an agreement which involves both sides of the aisle and which is bipartisan. The first effort to do this was Simpson-Bowles, a commission I served on. Uh, and it produced a $4 trillion reduction in deficits over 10 years. The majority of the reduction came from spending, but there was a significant amount of revenue in it. We picked as the size of the federal government, instead of the 24 percent it's at now and headed up, we picked the size of the federal government at 21.3 percent. And so you can see spending had to come down to that, and revenues had to come up to that. And it was a good proposal. $4 trillion of savings over 10 years. It didn't address health care, which it needed to, but it was as good as we could get, and it was voted for in a bipartisan way. Three of the most conservative, fiscally conservative members of the Senate voted for it, two of the most liberal members of the Senate voted for it. But unfortunately, it didn't move forward for a lot of reasons. That was followed by last summer, not this last summer, but the summer before, the debt ceiling debacle, which produced the super committee and the super committee was basically supposed to do the same thing that Simpson Bowles did, but it had statutory authority to act. So whatever they produced couldn't be ignored the way Simpson Bowles was. Whatever they produced had to go to the floor of the House and the Senate, had to be voted on up or down, and could not be amended. Very powerful committee. In fact, you could argue that for a brief period in time, we actually legislated that we would be a parliamentary government as versus electing them, major super majorities. That, they didn't reach agreement. That was followed by the Gang of Six, or right in that group was the Gang of Six, which were six members of the Senate, equally divided, Republicans and Democrats, who tried to work out an agreement. Now, the Gang of Six wasn't six, it was actually about 30. Um, now, that, they didn't reach an agreement either. Now we're coming on to 
Another major decision point on the issue of fiscal policy, which is the fiscal cliff. Now, I'm sure you are familiar with what this means, but basically, at the end of this year, three major fiscal events happen. One, a sequester goes into place. That's an across-the-board cut, the vast majority of it in the discretion, discretionary spending. And remember, federal spending is divided into discretionary spending and entitlement spending. Discretionary spending has to be appropriated every year, and it's about 30% of the federal budget. And it involves things like national defense, environmental programs, a lot of the education programs, health, a lot of the health care programs that are research-oriented, like NIH. The entitlement programs are, are not appropriated at all. They're laws that exist. And if you have certain, if you meet certain criteria, if you're a veteran, if you're over 62, with Social Security, if you're over 65 with Medicare, uh, you have the right to a benefit paid by the federal government, and it's on automatic pilot. Well, the sequester is a, is a $1.2 trillion cut over 10 years applied against discretionary spending. The vast majority of discretionary spending is defense spending. Uh, so the majority of the sequester falls on defense. That occurs on January 1st. That's followed by a tax increase because a whole series of tax deductions and, and, and exemptions lapse. The Bush tax cuts, which you hear about, lapse. The R&D tax cuts lapse. The AMT fix lapses. A whole series of things, representing three to five trillion dollars of new taxes if they go forward. And then lastly, there's the debt ceiling. We're coming up again to another debt ceiling event like we had two August ago, which is a pressure point. So this, these three events together are sort of the perfect storm of fiscal policy. And we're going to have a Congress coming back in December, which is going to be arguably a lame duck Congress. You may have a different control of either the House or the Senate. You may have a different president. But they have to make these decisions on what's going to happen or all these events go into place. And if they all went into place in their present form, there would be a massive massive retardation of our economy. The estimates vary between 2 and 5 percent. I mean, it would be significant, and we'd probably move back into some sort of potential recessionary period. So there has to be an orderly approach to this. All of these are driven, however, by the desire to get our spending and our debt under control. So there has to be an orderly decision on spending and debt. There's a group of us that was mentioned uh, involving Alan Simpson, Erskine Bowles, myself, and Ed Randell that are trying to put together a template or a resource for the Congress to work on. But the question becomes that they can reach an agreement on. But the question becomes, is it possible for our government, the way it's structured, to accomplish that type of an agreement? Or are we just simply going to sort of founder into either the fiscal cliff, which would create huge economic disruption, or potentially the stock markets and the, and the capital markets, at some point, saying they no longer have confidence in our currency because our debt is too high, which leads to a much higher increase in, in deficits, and we end up with a crisis the type that Europe has. Or can we do it in an orderly way? Which, is, which brings me back to the topic, which is who can do this? Well, the House can't do it. And the reason the House can't do it is because the House, over the years, has become gerrymandered based off of political positions, political parties. 60 to 65 percent of the House seats are elected by the party. In other words, if you win your party primary, you are the member of the House representative from that district because the other party doesn't have any votes of any significance in that district. To win your party election, you have to go through a primary usually. And to win a primary, you have to speak to the base. And the base on both sides of the aisle is uncompromising. And so what you get are people going to Congress who, by definition, if they want to get reelected, can't compromise because they'll upset their base, which is the people who elect them to the position. So the House is sort of locked into this stratified situation. We then have the presidency, which should be leading on this, and hopefully the next president, whether it's President Obama being reelected or President Romney, will lead. But if you listen to what they've been saying, so far, in their campaigns, they haven't really defined a plan which would lead and give us definition on this. And of course, the President Obama did walk away already from Simpson Bowles, so we know that what I consider to be at least the most viable entity is probably not there as the vehicle that would be used. Which comes back to the Senate. The Senate's essentially the only game in town on this issue. 
because it is still in the Senate. The Senate is still the place where compromise is required in order to get things done. In, in my years in the Senate, probably the best legislator I ever came across in the Senate was Ted Kennedy. Uh, he was chairman of the committee I was ranking on, and then I was chairman of the committee and he was ranking on. And the reason he was such an exceptional legislator was because he knew he couldn't get anything done if he didn't produce a bill that he could pass. Pretty simple, right? You know, you have to govern to actually govern. Well, it's an idea that's escaped many of my colleagues because they want to stand in the corner and shout for the purposes of speaking to their constituencies. But as a practical matter, in the Senate at least, there is still a working middle that has the capacity to produce a product that could actually address our fiscal problems. And I believe they're making progress on this. About two weeks ago, uh, well, three weeks ago now, myself and Erskine Bowles were invited up to speak to a group of senators. I expected 20 or 30 at the most, maybe 15, 15 or 20 maybe. 40 senators showed up. And we spoke for over an hour and a half, we talked, about what the process will have to be in December, what the procedures need to be, what type of structure should a, uh, should a grand bargain be, for lack of a better word, a compromise, a Simpson Bowles plus type of exercise. And the engagement was total. And I know it was total because as a senator, <clears throat> one of the things you learn very quickly is that if you can leave a meeting legitimately, you leave and you never come back. And these senators had three votes during this meeting and all of them kept coming back because they wanted to talk about how to do this and it was a totally bipartisan group. It had folks like Dick Durbin and Chuck Schumer and Tom Coburn and Mike Crapo there. So there is an energy now to do this and it is the place where it can get done. And I, I genuinely believe that if we're gonna get a major agreement in December, and it'll probably be a procedural agreement that puts us on a path to actually getting legislation by the middle of next year, if we're going to get that agreement, it's going to come out of the Senate. The leadership's going to come out of the Senate. But the Senate's going to have to be careful because it can't accomplish this if it tries to shut either side out. It has to be done with both sides participating. And that means the leadership of the Senate has to open the floor so everybody thinks they can participate. That's where we are as a government. I'm actually reasonably optimistic, but I wouldn't guarantee it. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. I've been directed to recognize students first. You must be a student. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You were the only one courageous enough to put your hand up. Well, um, just a couple of questions. Um, are you able to share with us uh, any of the components of uh, uh, what might be taking shape as a um, grand compromise on the fiscal cliff? And secondly, um, wouldn't anything that made it through the Senate have to go to the House? Uh, and what uh, is the dynamic that would be existing there, particularly since, I don't have to elaborate, there's a recalcitrant House? Right. Well, on your first point, it's still fluid. But I, I, I tend to think that the template of Simpson-Bowles is the one that makes the most sense. What basically, in, the next one would have to include health care because health care wasn't addressed and health care is our biggest issue. In fact, just in Medicare and Medicaid alone we have about a 65 trillion dollar, trillion, that's with a T, dollar unfunded liability. So those have to be addressed and they have to be brought into the package. But I think it'll be a package along the lines of Simpson Bowles. Simpson Bowles had some very specific discretionary cuts, basically a menu which reached a certain number. It had a social security reform package which made social security solvent for the next 75 years. And it had a, a, a tax reform package which basically eliminated a massive number of deductions and exemptions, took the revenue from that and used it primarily to reduce rates. So the rates in Simpson Bowles were 9, 15, and 23 percent. But took uh, another chunk of it, small but compared to what it used to reduce rates, to reduce the debt. I think that's the framework of, a, of an agreement. And that's why we're working so hard to produce a package that will be available. Not, you know, we don't expect to write the law, we're not in Congress, but to have a resource that can be used. On your second point, how do you deal with the House? I think the only way you can deal with the House 
Well, not the only way, but the best way, that, one of the ways to deal with the house is you have to have a package that is reached as a compromise coming out of the Senate that has the President's support. And then the President has to go to his party in the House and say, we're going to do this package. And you can vote for it because I'm going to give you political cover within our party. So members of his party, at least, will be able to cast their vote for that package and know that when they go back to their districts, which are gerrymandered, their base can't overly excoriate them because they will, he, they will be able to say, I was supporting the President he asked me to do this. That's how I think you get through the House. Other questions, yeah. Right. And do you see like increasing actions of like non-elected officials, such as like the Federal Reserve and stuff, as sort of trying to fill a void, or or do you see like further monetization of the debt as a way of dealing with it? That's really a good question. Uh, first off, on the first part, which is the failure of these different initiatives, government does not move in a lineal way. Okay, one of the things I learned is. It moves forward, then it moves backwards, then it moves sideways, then it moves forward, then it moves backwards. Then it just bounces all around. But it, if it's done correctly, it moves towards consensus. And I think that's what we're doing. We're moving towards consensus, an awareness specifically by the American public that the problem is real, significant, and that it's going to have a huge impact, not only in their life, but on their children's life. And that's, you know, I think one of the big issues in this election is that the American people are really discouraged, not by their, they're discouraged by their government, but they're more discouraged by the fact that for the first time in history, our generation may pass on to the next generation a less prosperous nation. And that really upsets people. That's, that violates a basic black letter rule of American governance. So I do believe we're making progress. And I do believe the fiscal cliff is going to be another pressure point, hopefully, that will lead to actual decisions. And that will depend on who the president is and how aggressive he is uh, and whether the Senate can breach an agreement. Uh, on the second question of whether or not the Federal Reserve is monetizing this in a way that is reflective uh, or involve, makes the, is involves in the process, yes, very much so. I think, I wrote a piece last week, actually I wrote a piece two days before they decided to go to QE3 saying they shouldn't do QE3 because I think it takes the pressure off the Congress to act. Uh, you know, if they're going to print all this money and put it into the economy, then the Congress is going to be able to get away with not acting. In fact, it becomes very cheap to borrow money. But at some point, you've got to pay the piper. I mean, it's just common sense tells you this. You just can't print all this money and not have to have an inflationary event at some point. When you, or, you know, the Fed obviously feels it can get it out of the economy, and there are reasons why that. I've had this discussion with Bernanke a number of times, but I just think they're so overboard on this that they're basically setting us up for an inflationary event maybe a year, two years, three years from now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say. That's a really good question. Uh, the Fed, as you know, uh, obviously, um, has two charges. One is to protect the value of the currency, which is to avoid inflation. And two is to do things that encourage full employment. The second point was put in very late. In fact, I think it was put in in the 60s in this, under something called Humphrey Hawkins. And it's only recently that the Fed has raised that really to the status of being equal to protecting the currency. Uh, and so I think that Bernanke is reacting to his full employment charge more than anything else. Now, he's obviously also trying to take pressure off the banks. And uh, to some degree, this does that. But on the other side of the coin, I think it sets up a banking problem down the road because if banks are lending at 1%, 3%, somewhere in that range, and then they're doing short-term arms, three, five-year arms, which means you borrow for three or five years and then your rate gets reset. If when that rate gets reset, say it gets reset at five, seven, eight percent, the person who's borrowed the money can't meet those obligations at that type of an interest rate, then you're going to have a huge banking crisis on your hands. And I think that's just something they haven't really thought about. But I think it's more his full employment, but I don't know. I don't have any insight into this. But that's what he said publicly, it's the full employment. Clearly the ECB, which is the Fed in Europe, is is trying to monetize this way out of the problem that they got in mind. But their, their balance sheet's two or three times larger than the Fed's on a relevant basis. Uh, so uh, 
that's what they're doing. But I don't think that's Bernanke's goal. Yeah. You retired at what many people would say was the peak of your career. Um, certainly, you were chair, widely respected in both parties and so forth. And clearly, you're very deeply engaged with issues that occupied you in the Senate. Um, are you of the opinion that you can have a bigger impact outside the Senate than as an esteemed senator and committee chair? Uh, well, I was ranking because we lost the majority. I would have been chairman next time. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Kathy and I did public service for 32 years. Uh, I ran in nine major campaigns. We ran in nine major campaigns, and we uh, just decided, you know, time's up, time's up. You know, been there, done that. It was time to move on. Granted, the issues are moving my direction from the standpoint of what I was really involved in. But after a while, you get tired of being sissious, trying to push that rock up the hill, and you turn it over to somebody else. So I, I don't regret leaving. I, I also didn't leave as a cynic. A lot of people leave, and they say, oh, the place is broken. It's in. I disagree. I think the Senate is still a great institution. I think it's a really spectacular place to serve, and I think it is still the most extraordinary deliberative body on earth that's ever been created in a, as a, a, for a democracy. Uh, and as such, I was—I didn't leave. With a, I, I left with great feelings about it, but it was time to move on. Yep. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of talk about, about like, like a house that's not able to compromise, but there's also many senators, and all these proposals assume like revenue generation and tax increases, but there have been many senators who pledge not to do even for one dollar revenue generation for ten dollars of spending cuts. So, uh, how do you reconcile that? Even the, the Senate may not be able to pass, even if consensus is moving toward that way, uh, that there is a huge body that doesn't want. Well, there's no question that within the Senate, there are folks who shout from the corners, just like the House, and that's our former governor. Uh, but the Senate also has a working center. I mean, 30 to 40, 40 actually, senators showed up for this meeting. I, I've had other senators tell me that if they reached an agreement, it'd be 60, 65. And I think it would be, uh, because I just think that's the nature of the Senate. There are clearly some people who want to speak to their constituencies and use that for a national platform down the road or some, for some reason aren't willing to come across the aisle uh, under any scenario. But they're, in the Senate at least, I think they're not, not anywhere near a majority. I think the working majority is very much in, capable of reaching an agreement on entitlement reform, which means you're going to have to change the benefit structure for Social Security and Medicare, and on tax reform, which means you're going to have to generate some revenues. Yep. You haven't mentioned something that strikes me as the biggest constitutional change in the history of the country, which is the uh, emergence of television as yeah. well as radio, replacing newspapers and print as the medium of communication. And I wonder if you want to comment on how you see that evolving with the added change of the internet, mm -hmm. which makes it possible now to have a network cross state lines very easily. Sure. I think it's absolutely extraordinary, and it's had a massive impact on governance in this country. Uh, when I first got involved and went to the House, you had probably 20 newspapers who had fully staffed uh, Washington offices with numerous, numerous investigative and regular reporters spreading out, producing content. Now you've maybe got four papers in this country that produce con content. Everybody else feeds off of that and repeats it. And then you have national television, which has become cable television, which has become cable news, and it's, for the most part, very opinion-oriented as versus content or, or substance-oriented. And you have people basically yelling at each other, hyperbolating, you know, and that, because they, that's the way they get their listeners and that's the way they get their advertising. And it's on both sides of the aisle. And so you really aren't seeing a lot of really good substantive content coming up out of the media, in my opinion, uh, especially out of the print media. Can't afford to do it. And then you overlay that with the point that you make, which is social media, which I think has had an immensely negative effect on political discussion. People say, well, it's great. Everybody gets to talk. Well, the problem is 
rational voices don't get to talk. They get drowned out by people who are often irrational, conspiracy driven, and very loud. Uh, when I used to, in the House, I used to hold a lot of town meetings. Well, I held them in the Senate too, but much more so in the House because it's sort of more your House activity. And I held them all over the state, every, every place, all the time. Little towns, big towns, every place. And I used to hold them on Monday night so that people go to Monday night football rather than come for the meeting. I have to admit to that. But basically, I, I, I enjoyed them. People would come. But almost invariably, a small handful of people would show up who were former SDMS members from the 60s. And a small hand people would show up who read Trim Magazine, which was the John Birch Society, and they'd meet there. It was the only place they ever met. It was the only place they could talk. And they'd suddenly get together and they'd go in the corner after the meeting and they'd start getting all excited about their issues. Now, of course, you've got this social media where literally the megaphone of the marginal is massively amplified. And it drowns out the capacity to get really substantive, thoughtful dis discussion. Uh, just lead the, read the blogs in response to somebody making a statement. It's just, it's outrageous. And, and uh, so I don't, you can't change it. I mean, the genie's out of the bottle. But it has, I think, really undermined political discourse, in my opinion. Yeah. I'm generally uh, left of center, so I'd be on the other side from where you are. You're in but, Vermont? I'm sorry, what? You're in Vermont? Right, no. <laughs> Actually, Florida. Um, but the... I mean, it's, it's refreshing to hear someone such as yourself and really want to give you kudos for working on a bipartisan way to try to uh, attack the, the uh, problems that we do you know, face. And, and I think the American public actually, with Simpson Bowles a type of approach, is probably in favor of it. Uh, I also really respect, even though I would probably, I suspect, disagree with him 80% of the time, is that Tom Colburn voted for Simpson Bowles. He did. And went against you know, Republican orthodoxy or Grover Norquist. Yeah. I do have a question about uh, bipartisanship. I was a little bit still concerned when Mitch McConnell made the statement that the first priority, and I don't recall, I may have the statement 100% correct, but basically the first priority of Republicans in the Senate is to see that Obama doesn't get reelected. <laughs> and, and that's certainly a political thing. I don't know if that was something that fostered bipartisanship. Uh, and I want to recall, because it's now four years ago that we were facing uh, an, you know, almost a financial collapse, you know, certainly in the credit markets. And if you recall, the, the, uh, the House uh, did not, and I don't know, I assume you voted for TARP as distasteful as it would be, uh, but the House did not vote for it the first time. And the stock market that day went down 777 points. And in a bipartisan way, because the Democrats really uh, came through on this, again, as distasteful as it was to benefit bankers who caused, who were part of the reasons for the problem, is that, you know, it was a bipartisan approach to at least accomplishing and getting us out of the uh, potential abyss. If, if that occurrence four years ago was happening today with the, with the current president, do you think that Congress actually would have voted for TARP or would have bought, or would the inability to be bipartisan have caused us to have a financial collapse? Well, I actually wrote TARP. I was the uh, point person in the Senate and uh, responsible for writing it. I carried Hank Paulson's water and the Senate Republican position. And, my, and along with Chris Dodd, who wrote it on the Democratic side, we negotiated it for 72 straight hours. And uh, the House did vote it down. Um, that was an interesting vote. Uh, it was voted down in a pretty much bipartisan vote uh, it's one of those votes where I think everybody in the House thought that somebody else was going to vote for it so they could cast the easy no vote and get away with it. And it turned out that everybody cast the easy no vote and it went down. Uh, if you'll recall, what happened immediately was that Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid stepped outside of regular parliamentary order and announced they were going to take it to the floor of the Senate. And it passed the Senate, I think, 79 with 79 votes totally bipartisan. Um, and that got the House to get their act together and then they turned around and passed it. Uh, yes, I think if that type of crisis struck again, you'd see a Congress acting aggressively and effectively. We are a country that acts in crisis. We are really a country that, and, and TARP's a good example of that. And it's been vilified since by people who, again, use it as a, as a phraseology. 
but didn't understand it and don't even admit to its success, which was that it did exactly what it was supposed to do. It stabilized the financial system, which was on the verge of collapse and would have basically destroyed millions of jobs in the United States. I mean, we would have had a depression, a depression with potentially 20, 30 percent unemployment, and every, every banking, bank in this country would have been either under or on the verge of going under. Uh, it stabilized that, so that didn't happen. And then it made about $30 billion for the taxpayers on warrants that have been paid back since, uh, since the banks uh, were able to stabilize themselves. So it actually turned out to be a, a very, very good proposal in my opinion. Um, would it happen again? Yeah, I, I honestly believe it would. I, I, I am an optimist about our, our government and our people in crisis. We do handle crisis well. Uh, we pull together, whether it was TARP or whether it was 9-11. We do pull together, and uh, I think Winston Churchill said it the best. He said, the United States will do the right thing after it's tried all the wrong things, and uh, we're just checking off wrong things right now, but we're going to get to the right thing. Now, the question is going to be, do we get to it through regular order in an orderly way, or do we wait for the markets to give us another crisis where we have to act and straighten out our financial house? Hopefully, we'll do it in an orderly way, uh, but I don't think, I, I think at that point, the the people who were responsible, the leaderships on both sides of the aisle, in the House and in the Senate, understood the seriousness of the situation and basically made, made an incredible piece of legislation from the standpoint of the speed with which it was brought up and the speed with which it was passed. Take, pass. Let me tell you a little story about that. We were negotiating this all day and all night for three days. And around 12.30 at night on Saturday night, Paulson had told us, Hank Paulson, Secretary Paulson, had told us that if we didn't reach a closure on this thing by 5 o'clock on Sunday, the Asian markets would open and it would be over. It would be over. Um, so around 12.30 at night, I was negotiating and I was outside the Speaker's office, Speaker Pelosi's office. It was myself, Rahm Emanuel, Barney Frank. Chairman, uh, Secretary Paulson was in another room negotiating another part, but the part that I was negotiating was regrettably the most difficult. It was called, uh, we were talking about how we were going to get the money back from the banks. And basically it broke down. Uh, we couldn't reach agreement. And Ron Emanuel got up, went, opened the door, went into the Speaker's office, called in Barney Frank. Came back 15 minutes later with the speaker. The speaker came in. She hadn't been engaged up until that point personally. She had her staff and everything. She said, we're going to do it this way and we're going to do it now. So in crisis, we act. You know, I always respected her for that. Uh, it was actually the idea I'd put on the table about five hours before, but I respected her anyway. <laughs> uh, so you know, we are a nation that can deal with crisis. And I think that's what the world looks at us now and says, they can't possibly let themselves continue on this road. They're just they're too resilient. They're a nation of problem solvers. The United States isn't going to allow itself to bankrupt itself. And that's what I think holds our currency up now and why our debt is selling at such great discount because if you look at the rest of the world, we're really the only place that people think that of. And uh, I still believe it. I just think our path to getting there is not linear. It's back and forth, back and forth, and hopefully we'll get to a decision here soon. You had a question? Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what changes do you think uh, the 17th Amendment, which changed the election of senators from the legislatures to direct, ele direct election made on the you know, Senate as a body? And the other is, what specific changes do you think we need to make to like, programs like Medicare because the fee for you know, service model isn't working? Uh, well, the first, the 17th Amendment, it was necessary. I mean, we were no longer going to allow legislators to elect senators, and popular vote was the, was the appropriate way to do it. And by that time, the nation had gotten past the tension of the convention, the con con Continental Convention, uh, because the Philadelphia Convention, because nobody, everybody knew the federal government wasn't going to overtake the states, and the states were going to have their rights, and there was no, that fear was no longer the priority. Uh, so there was no longer necessary to give the states that comfort that was needed to, to get the ratification passed. Uh, on Medicare, boy, that's a complex issue. 
I'll tell you, most of the really good work on this is being done right down here, right down here at, at, uh, at Dartmouth Hitchcock at the Institute, uh, following up on Wenberg's, Dr. Wenberg's great work. And uh, basically, the thumbnail, the answer is this. You've got to shift from a, from a utilization system to a values and outcome system. And you've got to shift from a system where people aren't sensitive to the, what they're purchasing to a system where they have some involvement in the cost structure of what they're buying. Uh, and you do those two things, uh, and at 30,000 feet, you'll start to address the problem. Uh, but it's really a complex issue. Students, I got to go to students and been given directions. Um, one of the big themes of your talk today and of general political discourse, with discourse is bipartisanship and maybe a lack thereof. As in your experience, you know, with as long tenures in the House and the Senate, have you noticed today's political climate as a specifically changed or heightened level of polarity, or is it something that's been relatively consistent? And if there was a change, what would you attribute that to? Well, I actually don't think it's changed that much. Um, when I was first elected to the House, Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House. And you want to talk about a tough partisan? This guy was right out of Boston, and he was classic. And the House had been controlled by the Democrats for 40 straight years. And they could care less what a Republican said, did, or whether they even showed up. Um, and they were tough, tough. Uh, and you look through our history and partisanship and intensity of conflicts. I mean, look at what they said about Lincoln. Uh, just incredible things. And uh, of course, you had uh, Senator Summers being bludgeoned with a cane on the floor of the Senate. Uh, and so it, the, the intensity has always been there. The difference, I think, goes to the question from the professor here, which is uh, the fact that the media, and especially the social media, and the 24-7 cable cycles has really reduced discourse to its lowest common denominator of the base and to conspiracy theories. <laughs> and rather than, you, you can't any, you know, you don't see a lot of, you, know, you wouldn't recognize the name, a guy named David Brody who wrote for the Washington Post for years ago. You know, he was a very liberal writer, but he was really substantive. You know, he took issues and he went through them and analyzed them and he gave them all, both sides a f fair hearing. You don't just see, you don't see people like that around. They're, they're there, but they don't have any visibility because they're so overwhelmed by, by this media. But I don't think the intensity of the conflict uh, the tension between the parties is any higher or lower than it's historically been. Yes. Um, how did you, as a senator, uh, deal with having to read through the, the huge, huge bills that you had to vote on? And how did the other senators that you knew deal with that? And how did that change over time? Uh, basically, you would obtain a working knowledge of the bill. If it was an important piece of legislation, you obtained a very significant working knowledge of the bill. If it was highly controversial, if it was not, if it was, let's say, the defense appropriations bill, you just knew generally what it said. And then somebody in the caucus who you respected, you knew they knew the bill inside and out, because they'd written it. For example, if it was a budget bill, theoretically, I, I knew it inside and out. And so other members of the caucus would come to you and say, well, what's it do here? What's it do there? They'd ask you the questions. And then usually if you had respect for that person, you'd vote with them if, they're, if the questions you had, you felt comfortable with their answers. You can't be knowledgeable on all everything. It's just, it's not physically capable. You have a lot of staff, and they're very good usually, and they, they do a lot of the, the work of analyzing the legislation, very important work. And then they tell you, they know your views, so they come and tell you where this is going to be sensitive to your view, this isn't, this is something you may have a problem with, this isn't. And so you can think about that. But, you know, <clears throat> on, the average, on, the bud, on a budget bill that we would have on the floor, we would have 40 amendments voted on. 40 amendments. I mean, you, nobody on that floor understood all those amendments with the exception of the people managing the bill. I mean, that is just physically incapable of doing it. So, it, 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 you had to have confidence in people you, have, you got to know and respect over the years for their knowledge, and, and then you took with a grain of salt what they told you and made your decision. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, you have a very clear chart up there about spending and taxes. If I understood you correctly, there were two assumptions that the spending level would stay uh, approximately at the historical average and that taxes um, and spending would be equalized. Now, both of those involve a lot of um, political compromise. And um, I'm wondering if your committee um, did more on the empirical side that took, because what I think you're trying to do is stabilize or increase the GDP. And I'm wondering if we could get away from some of the political issues and look at the effect that different tax levels and different spending levels have on GDP growth. And when well, people uh, it's a very good question, and it's hotly, highly debated when you're doing these budget type of issues. And dynamic scoring, which is what it's called, is not allowed. Uh, the CBO sets the, sets the strike zone. It's uh, very arcane in the way they analyze things. And in most instances, it does not score for what you would think might be a, a natural cause. Let me give you two examples. If you cut tax rates in capital gains, it's likely that people are going to sell their assets which they've had locked up in capital gains, and take that money, invest in something else, because they're going to turn their money over because they want to make more money. And they're going to do a much more efficient use of their money than sitting on an asset which they're not willing to sell because they don't want to pay the taxes. That will not be scored by CBO as revenue. Uh, in the healthcare area, where you're talking about the fact if you move from a, to an outcomes and value system, they won't score that. They will score if you cut doctors, because that they know what it is. They theoretically know what it is. It doesn't ever work out that way. But they'll give you a score for that because it's a hard number. But they won't score a system that in incentivizes people to produce better outcomes at lower costs because they see it as dynamic. And so the scoring mechanisms really restrict a lot of the activity that occurs in the area of budgeting. Um, and you know, you can argue, well, they should go dy to dynamic scoring, but really, you need a fair broker. You need a fair broker. My dynamic scoring is somebody else's, you know, political gamesmanship. So it's better to have the strike zone, know what it is, and live with the fact that you don't get the dynamic scoring. And um, that's the way we function as a government. I, I, I don't see a better way to do it, to be honest with you. I was curious about your reaction to being nom nominated as uh, the Commerce Secretary by President Obama. Did you see that as more of a political move on his part or more of recognition of your skills as a bipartisan legislator or just comment on your thoughts that, you know, what went through your mind in considering that position? Oh, he was obviously looking at my skills. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, at the time, you got to go back to the time. Uh, it was great. Enthusiasm. All of us were excited about having uh, the president, especially the fact that he was African American. I think it was a great statement for the nation. And uh, he was talking in terms of inclusion and you know bringing things together. And that had been his campaign. Um, and it just seemed like an interesting opportunity. Uh, had I thought about it, honest, you know, if I had stepped back and thought in an analytical way about it, I would have known immediately that it wasn't going to work because. My views of fiscal policy and his views of fiscal policy are very different. And it took me about a week to step back and say, geez, this isn't going to work. You know, the, the number one job of a member of the cabinet is to be 100% of the president, 100% of the time with the president. Uh, and uh, I just knew I wasn't going to be able to do that and maintain my own personal positions with a, a, a respect. So uh, it was my mistake. I should have recognized it earlier. He was always very gracious. He was very gracious about it. And it was not a good time for him because he'd already had a couple of cabinet people step back. Uh, but he was very decent and gracious about it, and I, it was my mistake. Well, I think our time's pretty much up here, but thank you very much for being here and look forward to being part of the Dartmouth community.